Keeping a promise is about more than just saying the words and then following through. I cannot respect nor understand the mentality behind breaking a promise. I am not one to ever break a promise, and this is doubly true for something as sacred as a wedding vow. When I was 15, I went to the movies with my friends Brian and Jacob to see National Lampoon's class reunion. During the interval, I came out to refill my popcorn. It was the end of October, and I remember walking into the lobby just as another movie was letting out. It was then I noticed Lynn standing amidst the crowd. I walked over and introduced myself to my longtime crush who eventually became my wife, Lynn. On our wedding day, my heart busted in joy when she walked down the aisle. She never looked so beautiful. We both vowed to make our lives joyful, but the feeling didn't last once we went on our honeymoon. Lynn and I both enjoy long rides, so instead of going to a popular honeymoon destination, we decided to drive to the coast and rent a yacht to sail on the sea for a week. It was quite romantic, and we were looking forward to it. But on the day of our journey, we got a flat tire and ended up in huge traffic. Our plan got jeopardized, and when we reached the coast, the daylight was gone. Lynn was frustrated and so was I that we couldn't enjoy the sunset with a glass of champagne as we planned. Anyways, we dropped off our car at the coast parking and got onto the yacht. Once the sailing started, all of our complaints and annoyance faded away. The serene waters, the cool breeze, the starry night sky made us fall in love over and over again. I turned off the engine and the yacht floated in the slowly moving waters. Lynn turned on some romantic music and we started to dance. The moon was shining bright and we were in dreamland. We got completely lost in each other's arms when a sudden jerk broke our concentration. The boat floated and hit the shore. I looked and found ourselves standing in front of a small distant island that was once linked to the main coastline. Look, we've come so far. Lynn pointed out at the city lights far away. I kissed her on the forehead and said, Yes, we have. She blushed to realize my undertone. I think I should start the engine and go back. We better anchor close to the coast. In the morning, we'll start sailing again. She agreed with me. I was heading back to the engine when a spine-chilling scream numbed our ears. It was the scream of a man writhing in pain. What was that? I... I don't know. It's coming from the island. We should leave. I better start the engine. But didn't you hear the scream? I think someone's in trouble. Lynn, we are not getting off at this unknown island at any cost. Oh my god, we need to help him. Before I could do anything, Lynn jumped from the yacht. Her feet left prints on the wet sand that sparkled in the moonlight. Where are you going? Come back, Lynn, it isn't safe. But she's always been a headstrong woman, so she didn't listen to me. Out of fear and worries, I followed her too. But for our safety, I took the gun that I brought along just in case. I still feel lucky that I did. We started to walk into the woods. The moonlight guided us, and even though it was dark, we could spot our surroundings quite clear. Leaves rustled under our feet as we walked barefooted. After walking like this for five minutes straight, we didn't hear any scream or see anyone. Lynn, let's go back before we get lost in these woods. We won't get lost. I'm sure the scream came from this direction. Well, now it's gone. Problem solved. Come on, let's go. Wait a second. Can't you just... But 
Before she could finish, we heard a terrifying laughter in a close distance. A group of bats flew over our head, and I understood something bad was coming our way. The laughter grew louder, as if a group of madmen were laughing their hearts out. We slowly tiptoed following the sound and saw flames behind some trees. As we ducked down to peek from the bushes, a horrifying scene unfolded right in front of our eyes. There were five people dancing hand in hand around a fire pit while laughing like crazy. None of them had clothes on their upper bodies. The lower portions were covered with leaves and bark. I could tell that they were tribals. White paints were smeared on their faces, making them even scarier. They had long, filthy nails like animals. After circling the fire three times, they stopped and threw their hands at the sky, cheering. They kept on repeating this. One of them walked to a big rock, and that's when we noticed the bigger horror. Upon that big rock lay a body of a man whose head was decapitated. He was wearing casual clothes, which hints he too was traveling by this area, like us. The tribal guy dragged his body and placed it near the fire. Another member of the group then picked up something and held it high in the sky while screaming those same lines. Nitiko enadra nabula, ni dua nakabula. As the fire illuminated his hands, I could see what he was holding. It was the severed head that once belonged to the body lying on the ground. He opened his mouth and let the dripping blood fall onto his tongue from the head. He then licked his lips like he had tasted the heavens and threw the head inside the fire. Lynn and I watched all this in dead silence. We knew that if we made any sound, we would end up like that dead guy. After destroying the man's head into the fire, the group lunged onto his body like a pack of hungry wolves and started to tear his flesh with their sharp nails, using them like claws. The sound of flesh tearing and then getting chomped by these freaks made me nauseous. Lynn couldn't take the sight anymore and she screamed in fear. As soon as she did that, we realized we'd have to run for our lives. The blood-soaked human-like animals immediately looked at us and their eyes dazzled. They smelt the air and started to drool like they just found more food. Lynn, we have to go now! We got up and started to run to the shore. The pack of cannibals chased us while making horrific sounds. They were howling and laughing while running behind us. I knew that if they caught us, we wouldn't stand a chance. I turned back and saw they were immensely tall and excessively strong. They were like a lost race of human beings on whom the theory of evolution didn't work. I fired onto the closest one and he fell on the ground holding his chest. I took training classes when I got this gun, so my aim was bullseye. I thought the rest of the group was going to chase us even more fiercely knowing that we shot one of their members but what happened next still gives me nightmares. The rest of them stopped, seeing the blood coming out of their very own cannibal brother, but instead of helping him, they all lunged at his chest. They started to eat one of their own without any hesitation. Their distraction gave us a second chance at life. We hopped onto the yacht while the group devoured their fifth mate. I started the engine right away and picking full speed, drove the yacht to the coast. I can't explain how we got home that night. We wanted to report to the cops, but we knew no one would believe us. Also, the situation traumatized Lynn to such an extent that she still can't bear any loud sound or the sight of blood. I searched online about the phrase that they were chanting that night. 
As per my research, they were speaking Fijian, which happened to be the language of the Fiji tribe. They were known to be a cannibalistic tribe, but no one found traces in years. So the phrase, Nitiko enadra nabula, nidua na kabula, meant, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. My wife and I play a scavenger hunt game on every anniversary. This has become like a tradition now. 15 years of marriage has lost 90% of the spark, but till today, we've been holding on to this facade of finding fake treasure. None of us admits, but we both know we do this to pretend like a happy couple so that we don't end up getting a divorce. At least, that's my reason. Similarly, this year on the 23rd of January, Martha woke me up with a big smile that I hadn't seen in a while. Past few months, things were even worse between us. We were always fighting, and I spent more time at the office than at home. Hence, I got surprised to see her standing near the bed with a big smile, like she had something big planned for me. I saw she was wearing a blue dress that she used to wear when we met. The dress still fits her fine and it had been a long time since we came close to each other. Taking this one opportunity, I got up and walked to her. I caressed her cheek and said, Happy anniversary. You look beautiful. You should dress like this more. She hugged me and said, Maybe then I'll finally be able to have your attention. I realized that she was trying too hard to be excited for our anniversary. I didn't say anything and went straight to the bathroom. I knew that's how she was going to be all day, poking and taunting me with lots of sugar coating just to point out what a bad husband I am. Enough is enough, I thought to myself while splashing water on my face. But anyways, this is a fucked up marriage. A change of plans immediately kicked in. I came out and made a call to my office. Hearing me talking to my secretary, Martha walked in and said, Are you planning to go to work? Even today? Well, who are we kidding, darling? What do you mean? We both know things aren't the same anymore. Then what's the point of spending time this evening, like a must-have ritual, while pretending to be a happy couple? <laughs> Don't be silly. We always play scavenger hunt. You know how much I love giving you surprises. I'll prepare the clues for the quest. Be home at 7.30 p.m. sharp. Be home by then if you change your mind. Her calm behavior, even after I spit some bitter truth, shocked me. I wasn't expecting that. I thought she would scream and make a scene for announcing our marriage's expiry date. I might have asked her what was going on, but I was too irritated to continue any conversation with her. I got ready and went downstairs to have some breakfast. Martha made all my favorites, and I was spellbound to see how much effort she was putting into making our broken marriage work. I ate whatever I could, and she sat opposite to me and watched me with a blank gaze. When her wide, staring eyes started to creep me out, I said, Do you want to tell me something? No, I just want to show you something. That'll only happen if you come home for the treasure hunt. The treasure I have planned for you will be one of a kind. After finishing my breakfast, I drove away, taking my car. Martha stood on the house porch and watched me fade away. The entire ride, I couldn't help but think how weirdly she was behaving. When I reached the office, I saw Diane sitting in my office with a cup of tea. These days, She's the only person who understands me. We have formed a connection. It started with one late night over time, and now we are running into this illicit affair hiding from everyone's eyes. I went close to Diane and smiled. She said, You shouldn't be at work today. It's your anniversary after all. Please, don't start again. Why, did something happen? I don't know. Martha was acting pretty weird in the morning. She said she had something big planned. Then 
don't break her heart. Return home soon today. I don't want to. Maybe we should go to dinner tonight. I know how wrong it is to cheat on Martha. I decided to put a stop to this dual life. I will propose to Diane to move in with me and ask Martha for a divorce tomorrow. That's why I wanted to take Diane out for dinner tonight. I sat down and started to finish all my pending work. Diane went to handle the client calls and it was an ordinary day, irrespective of the fact that today is my 15th marriage anniversary. After two miscarriages and big fights, Martha and I grew apart. But I don't know why she's not ready to accept the truth that there's nothing between us. Maybe she still loves me, but it's time to come out before we reach the peak of toxicity. I worked like crazy the entire day just to forget how miserable my life had become. Around 7 p.m., I was all set to leave for dinner with Diane. I called her, but she didn't pick up. I went to her desk and found it empty. I wondered if maybe she had gone to the ladies' room when I saw a sticky note on her desk. It read, Got an urgent. Have to cancel the plan tonight. I became upset again because I was really looking forward to spending some time with her. Thinking of what to do next, I began with the hard path. It's better late than never. I got into the car and drove home. And be honest with my wife that I wanted a divorce. When I reached home, I found the main door slightly open. Stepping inside, I got a bit spooked at first. There were candles lit all over the house, and a mysterious darkness dwelled in every nook and corner. Uh, Martha. Martha. I slowly walked upstairs navigating my way amidst the light and dark. I twisted the doorknob of our bedroom and found it locked. Happy anniversary! <laughs> oh, you scared me. I'm so happy you came back in time. Yeah, uh, some work got postponed. Please, uh, open the door, Martha. I need to freshen up, and after that, we need to talk. But I can't open this door, darling. It'll ruin my treasure hunt. The treasure is on the other side of the door. I wanted to say right then and there that I was not interested in her treasure hunt and neither wanted a life with her, but I somehow controlled myself. Martha made me freshen up in the guest room and said to come for our special anniversary dinner. I thought I would hurt her anyway today, so why not tag along for a bit before slamming the hard reality on Martha? We sat for dinner, and I could see a big plate kept on the table with a metal lid on it. That's it? Only one dish? I was expecting her to go overboard this time. Martha poured me a glass of wine and said, I made special steak with sautéed veggies tonight. Saying this, she opened the lid and served the biggest steak on my plate. We both started to eat quietly. Although I was eating like I usually do, Martha took every bite while staring at me with a big grin. How do you like the meat? Uh, yeah, it's very juicy. Where did you buy it from? A shop near your office. Oh, really? I see. What's the name of the shop? <laughs> You'll find out soon. She held my hand, and I could feel her tight grasp on my finger. Her sharp, long nails almost pierced my skin as she grabbed my hand too tight. After a highly awkward but tasty dinner, I was feeling too full. Martha came with an envelope and said, This is your first clue for the treasure hunt. You can start now. Reluctantly, though, I opened the envelope and read the first clue. As the game progressed, I noticed how simple the clues were. I mean, it were as if Martha wanted me to find the treasure without any hurdle. The last clue was put inside a blue envelope with the words dinner written on it. I opened it and there was a folded paper and our bedroom key. Walking upstairs with the key, I said, what is all this? Don't you want to find out? 
The name of the shop from where I bought all the meat is inside that paper and your treasure behind that door. Being totally confused, I opened the paper to look and my leg froze on the floor. A cold shiver ran down my spine as I read the shop name. D-I-A-N-E Oh my god! I looked back at Martha and she said, Happy anniversary, darling. <laughs> I opened the bedroom door with trembling hands and saw Diane lying on her bed, chopped up like a piece of meat. Her stomach was slashed, chunks of flesh were missing from her thighs. Martha killed my mistress and cooked her for our anniversary dinner. It didn't take me much time to realize that she must have called Diane and threatened her to see her without informing me. Scared, Diane stepped into her trap to stop this scandal from spilling out. I turned around and saw Martha dialing up 911. She called the cops and said, Hello, officer. I have murdered someone. Please come to this address soon. She didn't say a single word to me. Neither could I say anything to her. Until the cops came, she sat at the dining table, finishing the rest of the steak with a glass of wine. I couldn't help but vomit on the floor while Martha laughed, seeing me suffer like this. She was sentenced to life imprisonment, and I live alone in this big house where my wife took revenge for cheating on her. Every night, I woke up with the smell of human blood choking the air in my room. I wash my hands, brush my teeth, take showers, but that smell never goes away. My doctors say I'm on the verge of suffering from dehydration, as whatever I eat, I end up vomiting. But what can I do? No matter how many times I vomit, the taste of human flesh never goes away from my insides.